This is Frank Knight. The Adventures of Longine. In the Adventures of Longine, there are recorded many interesting events. It's recorded that the longest eclipse of the sun in a period of 1,200 years occurred in 1937. This fiery celestial spectacle, which in olden days was viewed with terror, gave scientists a brief opportunity to study the mysterious corona of the sun, visible only during an eclipse. The Hayden Planetarium Expedition of the American Museum of Natural History went to Peru to make, and we quote, timing calculations of greater precision than ever before attempted on any eclipse. The timing equipment consisted of Longines watches, and the timepieces included Longines chronometers, Longines chronographs, and Longines one hundredth of a second watch. It's a great honor that Longines watches were selected for this and many other important scientific expeditions, but it's no surprise, considering the fact that leading government observatories have all bestowed first prizes and innumerable other honors on Longines watches for their exceptional accuracy. It's a fact that throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch. The Longines Chronoscope each week looks for the truth in the important issues of the hour. And here to discuss these issues are our co-editors. Mr. Henry Hazlitt, a political economist of respected judgment and contributing editor of Newsweek magazine. And Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Paul Gray Hoffman, former director of ECA and president of the Ford Foundation. In this spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion, the opinions are necessarily those of the speaker. Mr. Hoffman, I gather from your new book, Peace Can Be Won, that though you're now in private life, you're still in favor of the foreign aid program. Uh, definitely yes, Mr. Hazlitt. <clears throat> I wonder if I can tell you why. Because I believe in peace, and because I believe and hope that free society can survive in the United States. I do not believe we can have peace, nor do I believe that free society can survive in the United States unless we play our appropriate part in helping the rest of the free world to remain free. Specifically, sir, do you believe, do you favor the bill now before Congress? You mean the bill that calls for eight and a half billion dollars of foreign aid? Yes, sir. Well, of that amount, some six billion, three hundred million dollars is for military aid, uh, for Europe. Uh, I'm not a military man, have no judgment, but if General Eisenhower says he needs six billion, three hundred million dollars, I'm forgiving General Eisenhower six billion, three hundred million dollars for military aid. Well, Mr. Hoffman, isn't that military aid really at bottom, economic aid. Doesn't come down to this, that what we are saying is that these European nations can't afford to arm themselves, and that therefore we have to take that over. And isn't that really an economic question? Well, I think that, <coughs> that we'd have to qualify somewhat if you'd say that they can't take care of the job of arming themselves quickly enough to meet the threat of the Soviets. I go along with you. They can't do that by themselves. And well, I think we have to help them uh, to arm themselves so that that arming can play, take, uh, take place quickly enough. Well, if it's a question of our supplying arms, that's one thing. But aren't we really, in effect, saying they can't afford to buy those arms from us? We do a lot of things. Let's say we need tin, we need rubber, we need wool. But we buy them from the outside. Why can't they buy arms from us? Well, uh, it's a very simple answer because they haven't the dollars. And we, so won't, and we won't take anything but dollars. But then it does come down to an economic question well, and not primarily a mil military question. I think it's very definitely an economic question, as well as a military question. Yes. Well, now, uh, on the $2 billion of uh, aid, I think there's $2 billion, two two billion two, uh, yes. recommended for this year. Do you remember how much the recent one was? It was $2 billion seven or something like well, that? For Western Europe alone, yes. it was uh, something under $3 billion. 
That was for Western Europe, I should say, and I think some very small amount of aid in, in Asia. This bill is just two billion two, is about a billion six for Europe, and about six hundred million for Asia, as I remember. Well, now your uh, successor, Mr. Foster, testified a little while ago, testified this year before Congress, that the uh, European countries had today a 40% increase in production and in industrial production over pre-war period. Right. And a nine percent increase in industrial, in uh, agricultural production. Right. Now, in view of that, why do we continue to need to pour in aid there? Well, I don't think if it hadn't been, I think it had not been for this emergency uh, that uh, we, that Europe, except in a few countries, uh, could have carried its carried itself. That is, I think England, you know, all aid to England was stopped last uh, December. I think. I think that several other countries had reached a point where they no longer needed economic aid. Uh, certain countries did. It was our original thought that we'd have this program down, you know, starting the first year at five, that with improvement, it would go down to four, go down to three, and the last year would be two. Well, those figures were, of course, beaten, and we also, uh, and also, uh, the European countries, with our help, uh, got recovery more rapidly uh, than we had originally anticipated. Mr. Hoffman, I'm interested in a transition in your own life. You were a very successful American industrialist, and as such, you were interested in balancing books. And then you became uh, one of our firmest advocates of vast foreign spending. Now, do you see anything anomalous in that change? Uh, no, I, I don't, uh, because uh, my uh, approach uh, to foreign aid, I think, is strictly a business approach. In other words, I have never been able to see or believe that we could have peace and prosperity in the United States unless we were in a reasonably peaceful and prosperous world. Now, as a businessman, I always okayed with, I think, wisdom, a budget of around 1% to 2% a year uh, for uh, promotion that wasn't going to pay off in this year or next but over the long pull would pay off. Now, I have looked on foreign aid as promotion by the United States to help bring about peace and prosperity to the world. This spending, though, this spending of billion dollars, billions of dollars, we've noticed, those of us in Washington, it becomes a rather heady business. Now, uh, it causes a man to adopt a certain social worker attitude. Uh, would you say that it's caused you to change any of your personal views, that experience? Uh, definitely not. I, I, I really think that uh, our administration of aid, of aid, the foreign aid, was very hard-headed. I, I happen to think that the greatest <coughs> bargain the American <coughs> people ever got, uh, they got to the spending of money under the Marshall Plan. You have no doubt that, <coughs> that what you've done is, is to the best interest of this country. Well, I, that puts me in a position where I have to be somewhat immodest, but certainly I would not have been associated with the Marshall Plan if I had not fully believed in the Marshall Plan from the American point of view. That's, and you, you would say well, that your, uh, your uh, first interest has always been the national interest of the United States. I, I certainly think uh, that we have every right, I always have said we have every right <coughs> to determine, one, whether we'll send any, any dollars abroad, or where we'll send them, and to do that on a basis of our own interest, the interest of the U.S. But I say it's got to be a somewhat enlightened self interest. Well, Mr. Hoffman, we get back away from these generalities down to the specific figures. Secretary Atkinson said a few days ago that this country was going to have to spend $25 billion in the next few years for the foreign aid program. Now, even some of the <laughs> Democratic uh, members of Congress are backing up against that. And Mr. Douglas, uh, Senator Douglas, wants to reduce it about a billion or so. And even Senator Connolly burst forth tonight. Uh, what do you think of the specific figures that are being proposed for well, foreign aid? I think now we, an, an economic aid, talking about that first, the two billion two that is pro projected for this next year is in line with what I thought would be necessary uh, to just help build prosperity in the world and to help promote peace in the world. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not in no position uh, to pass judgment on the amount of military aid required. I think that any effort uh, to say what is required three years from now, uh, 
does involve a, a considerable amount of guessing. The world situation can change in a year or two years. If it did, I'm sure that Secretary Atchison would be the first one to want to change uh, his estimate. But remember this. The thing that's very important is that we do everything that we can possibly do to keep peace in the world. Because if World War III breaks out, according to estimates I believe to be reliable, we'll start spending a billion dollars a day. World War III would cost a billion dollars a day. Now, if I could be sure <coughs> that I am sure that the expenditure of the money up to this time uh, has helped <coughs> us to maintain peace. Uh, if I was sure uh, that any amount was necessary to maintain peace, I would think it a very good investment. You believe, sir, let me ask one last question. You believe, then, that uh, communism can be fought successfully with money? No, not money alone. I don't, I think it takes money, among other things, to fight communism. That's a long story, I think. Yes, but you believe that communism is an effect, that it's the result of a declining economy, or do you believe that it's the result of ideas vigorously presented by intellectuals? I think it's the result of both. I think I think you have had uh, <coughs> I, you have had very false ideas, and I think that have had to be combated. And I do think I'm sorry, Mr. Hoffman, but I'm afraid our time is up. Sorry you couldn't finish that interesting answer, but I appreciate very much for being with us tonight. The editorial board for this edition of the Lonesine Chronoscope was Mr. Henry Hazlitt and Mr. William Bradford Hewitt. Our guest was Mr. Paul Gray Hoffman, president of the Ford Foundation. Throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch. Honored for excellence and elegance by 10 World Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medal awards, and highest honors for accuracy from the leading government observatories of the world. Whenever you have an occasion to purchase a watch, for yourself or as a gift, it's well to remember that if you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, you're paying the price of a lawn jean. And you should insist on getting a lawn jean. World honored for excellence, elegance, greater accuracy, and long life. Longin, the world's most honored watch. Sold and serviced by more than 4,000 leading jewelers from coast to coast, who proudly display the emblem, Agency for Longin Whitnor Watches. Next week, at this same time, over the CBS television network, the Longines Whitnor Watch Company will again present the Longines Chronoscope. The world's most honored watch is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnall. Distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, editor of the Freeman and contributing editor for Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Estes Keefover, United States Senator from Tennessee. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Senator Kefauver, the members of our chronoscope mm -hmm. audience, of course, remember you, sir, from your sensational crime investigation. They know that you are the vigorous Tennessean who now aspires to the Democratic nomination for the presidency. 
And tonight our audience will appreciate the views on some of your political views. Now, sir, what, uh, if you are running for the Democratic nomination, what is your present criticism, or what is your principal criticism of the Democrat, uh, Democratic administration that now exists? Well, Mr. Huey, I think I may make this very clear in the beginning that I'm uh, running on my own. I'm not, uh, I think that we have had a too great and fine democratic administration. I have supported the foreign policy and the economic and social program of both President Roosevelt and President Truman. You are a new so dealer not, and a uh, fair dealer. Well, I don't, uh, I don't classify myself as uh, on the dealers. I believe in uh, progress. And uh, if you want to say a new dealer or a fair dealer, I believe that the American people have made great advancement both in our foreign policy and in our domestic policy under the last two democratic administrations. If you want to know why I'm running for president, I feel that uh, every American boy uh, aspires to run. I want to do what I can to see that we continue on with an aggressive foreign policy, that we do not abandon our place of leadership in the world. Also, I'm very much interested in seeing that we continue to have our social and economic gains. And the effort against uh, corruption. I want us to see the federal government taking a more leading part. doesn't trust me as being something to be I'm not trying to draw issues between Mr. Truman and myself or between anyone else and myself uh, running because I feel that I have the qualifications that I've had the experience that I have the ideas for the future of America that the American people want.
time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Donald I. Rogers, an editor of the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Dr. Jules Backman, professor of economics, New York University. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Dr. Backman is one of the nation's leading experts on wages and prices, and as a former consultant of the Office of Price Stabilization, we'd like to explore some of your theories about the present state of the nation's business and the nation's economy. Can you tell me, sir, is it true, as we read in the papers, that we're in a state of recession at the present time? Well, I think that depends on what you're looking at. The answer is yes, if you're talking about the civilian economy, that is, automobiles, building, textiles, apparel. The answer is no if you're talking about war industries because war production continues to expand. Well, how about we people who work in neither the heavy industries nor the war industries? Well, uh, you fellows in the financial field, uh, uh, writers, are uh, doing just about all right. There's been no special recession or expansion there. Are you telling our audience, sir, that if it were not for war industry now and the demands of the rearmament program that the country might well be in a serious recession well, I don't know how serious it would be, Mr. Huey, but I am convinced that we'd have a considerably large amount of unemployment, we'd have lower prices, we'd have less inflation, and we'd have less demand generally. We'd have a condition which wouldn't look as good as it does today. Now, you're saying that in the war industries, uh, things are holding well. Uh, where is business worse in the country now? Well, I guess we get the most complaints, and justifiably, from uh, the textile industry and from apparel. Uh, the Television and appliance industry hasn't been doing too well. These days, you know, if you walk into one of these appliance stores, it's almost impossible to get out at any price. Well, very recently, they removed the credit restrictions. Uh, they removed Regulation W, which means that anyone can go in and charge things and pay for them over a longer period of time. Do you think that that will help the television and appliance industry, and perhaps the apparel industry as well? I think it'll help the appliance industry a little, but the real reason why appliances have not been selling is that the fellow who bought himself a television set a year ago, instead of waiting until he thought he could afford it in 1952, just doesn't buy it now. In other words, when the war broke out in Korea, many people rushed out to buy. Scare buying. Scare buying. And part of the problem we faced is that people have not been undertaking that type of buying now, and they haven't been doing the normal buying. Are the retailers paying now for what they reaped back right after the Korean War? Yes, they are. And uh, I think if you look at the figures, you'll find that the extra amount of selling at that time is just about equal to the smaller amount of selling now. It's sort of canceled it. It's, it's sort of canceled out. The public, the public demand for goods is now going down. Is that correct, sir? <coughs> I think the public demand for goods has gone down a little. Uh, whether it's going down at this moment is difficult to say. It seems to be sort of stabilizing at a lower level than we had a year ago. And our, our audience is particularly interested in prices. Now, what, what about prices? Are they on their way down? Well, thus far, we've had some good uh, uh, hints as to what may happen. Uh, prices at retail usually are the last to fall. But I'm happy to say that at wholesale, they have declined. And we've already had a considerable number of announcements of lower prices for uh, appliances, for clothing, uh, I guess about everything except fresh fruits and vegetables and rents. Now, you say you're <laughs> happy to say that, sir. Uh, it, in other words, do you regard it as a good omen, as good for the American people for prices to come down? Well, Mr. Huey, when you see what the dollar buys, uh, any uh, step in the direction of buying a little bit more is a good omen. In other words, sir, you, you feel that uh, it is perhaps a, a, a good sign if the wholesaler and the retailer do not make so much profit. It's not only a question of how much profit they make, it's a question of what we have to pay when we walk into a store. Now, if they sell a large volume of goods, they can make money even though they don't make as much on each unit. Let's call that turnover. 
Now, in this uh, period where the war industries are holding, but where prices are, are coming down, who are the best paid people, the best paid workers <coughs> in the American economy now? Well, the best paid workers uh, generally are coal workers, steel workers, construction workers, automobile workers. Uh, they generally run anywhere from 25 to 50 cents above the average for all manufacturing industries. Aren't these the very workers who create most of the labor strife, looking for more uh, higher increases in pay? They're usually in the forefront. Well, now, why is that, sir? Why are these industries, are they to blame for it? Or who's to blame for the fact that they, they can't continually seek higher wages? Well, many of these workers are in industries which are essential to the war effort. And when something is scarce, as labor is in those industries, you go out and try and get it. In other words, these are the people that have the, are in the best bargaining position to get higher wages. Well, yes, uh, look at the contrast between uh, the textile workers who are fighting to stay in the same place and say steel workers who are fighting to jump way ahead. The textile industry isn't doing too well. The steel industry moves along at capacity. In other words, it's, a, it's a, an effort on the part of the steel industry to take advantage of the war situation to get a higher wage scale for themselves. You mean the steel workers? The yes, steel I workers. think that that's the case. When uh, uh, there's a shortage of workers, they try to get more. When there's a surplus, they just don't get more. For example, in 1949, they didn't get wage increases largely because business conditions were sort of settling down. Supply and demand working on the labor side. Very definitely. Well, don't you feel, however, that the textile, uh, in the textile industry particularly, they're just waiting for the steel issue to be settled? Well, it's difficult to talk for the textile industry, but uh, from what I've been able to find out about it, they're hoping they can get the same contracts they had before, because business has been pretty bad in that area. Now, Dr. Backman, our audience has heard uh, a great many experts on the steel controversy. Now, uh, some of them said they were speaking for the people, some for the government. We've had this, uh, an able spokesman for industry. You, perhaps, could qualify as being objective. Now, can you, how would you simplify the present steel controversy for our audience? Well, I'd say one thing we'd want to know is what is the uh, economic position of the steel workers? How much money are they making compared with other workers? You how much are their wages they were increased? More. Well, that's one aspect. The other question is uh, how much have their wages increased recently? Well, now, we've had uh, Mr. Arnold and others have talked about the catch up that it was necessary for the steel industry now to precipitate a crisis so that they could catch up. Now, what are they catching up to? Well, that's something I have not been able to find out. If you look at the figures, they look something like this. The steel workers run in the top 10 or 15 percent of workers in terms of wages in the economy. If you go back to almost any date you want, go back to 1939, they made 20 cents an hour more than all manufacturing workers. Go back to the end of the war, they made 20 cents an hour more. Uh, go back to the beginning of 1950, before Korea, they made 24 cents more. You look at the figures today, they're making 24 cents more. I think what happened is this. When the steel industry and the workers agreed to a, an increase last year, temporarily, steel workers got up to a spread of as much as 33 cents. Then when the other workers caught up to steel, they came back to this 24 cent spread, and that's where they are today. And if steel workers get an increase, I think it's pretty clear as to what will happen with other workers. The others will go ahead with them. Well, John L. Lewis seems to be waiting, aluminum, uh, retailers, you can go right down the line. There are right. a number of industries. Now, when Mr. Ellis Arnold, the uh, economic stabilizer, was on this program, he said that if the steel industry was given <coughs> its price increases, it would cost the average American family about $400 a year because the prices of other metals and other services, other supplies would go up along with steel, which perhaps was logical reasoning. But we never did explore the other side. Suppose the steel workers are given their wage increases. What will that cost the American family per year? Whether the steel industry gets a price increase or not, Americans generally are going to pay for the steel wage increase. If the steel industry gets no price increase, it will mean that the tax collections of the government will fall. And if that increase spreads throughout the economy, that fall in tax collections will run over $5 billion a year. And I might add that that runs well over $100 for every family in the country. In other words, every family in the country will pay over $100 a year for the steel wage increases. They'll have to pay it either in the form of higher taxes. If the government must collect more taxes, it will. Let me make this point clear. If the government 
pays for this wage increase out of tax revenues. Yes. Whether we get a tax increase or not, the American people will pay because the fundamental, the basic source of inflation, this business of somebody reaching his hand into your pocket and taking something out, is the government spending more than it takes in. And the major effect of no price increase in steel will be that the government will spend even more than it expects to in relationship to what it takes in. All right. In the face of all this, Mr. Backman, Dr. Backman, we are decontrolling, we are removing controls from our economy. We are allowing uh, credit controls to be removed. We are allowing price controls to be removed. We are permitting steel to be used as much as people want to use it, aluminum, so on and so forth. Do you find any significance in this trend? Well, it's interesting to me to find the administration going to Congress and saying they need a tight price control law at a time when they are lifting controls and at a time when they are getting rid of credit controls, which are really basic to the whole problem of price rises and inflation. Of course, it's an election year. That might have something to do with it. Well, Dr. Backman, I'm very much sure, I'm sure that our audience very much appreciates your views, and thank you, sir, for being with us. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Donald I. Rogers. Our distinguished guest was Dr. Jules Backman, Professor of Economics of New York University. It seems like a nice idea. On the wedding day, the bride and groom give watches to each other. If you're planning a wedding, you may be glad to know that recognizing the social acceptance of this custom, Longines has produced an exciting series of duets. Exquisite Longines watches in matching styles. Each bride's watch, a diminutive replica of the groom's watch. Exchanging watches is likewise a growing custom between husbands and wives for anniversary gifts. To honor the bride and groom, to honor the graduate of the class of 1952, to honor your husband or wife on your anniversary, give a Longines, the world's most honored watch. The only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy from the world's observatories. Yet you may buy and own, or buy and proudly give a Longines watch for as little as 7150. Longines duets and other beautiful Longines watches are sold only, sold only by authorized Longines Whitnor jeweler agencies. Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Receive about $650 million, and he was informed that, uh, the uh, ambassador informed him that we would only give about $525 million, and our ambassador also said, or left a note saying, that he expected, or we expected, France to increase its military budget, and that the French Premier objected very strongly to that and said it was principle. Now, I'd like to ask you whether, uh, where do you think this leaves the situation? Does it mean that the French uh, would resent the imposition of conditions by us, or does it simply mean that they, they resent particular conditions? I think it's uh, one of those uh, difficult uh, which uh, happened between the best uh, friends it was a difference of opinion on the question of the importance of the American uh, help to the French government, as you rightly say, and uh, also maybe a difference of opinion about uh, the conditions in which uh, such uh, help uh, would be given. 
Uh, I'm confident it will be straightened out uh, by through negotiations both in Paris and uh, in uh, Washington. Many difficulties of the same uh, kind in the past uh, were uh, finally uh, straightened out well, and you don't uh, fairly easy. You don't think this is inherent in the situation, that there's a real dilemma here, that if we don't put conditions on our aid to foreign countries, then the money may be wasted from our point. But if we put, do put on conditions, then the conditions are resented. Now, that's always seemed to me a dilemma. What do you? No, the, the, the dilemmas in that matter are uh, never so uh, clear-cut as that. I think uh, there are so many ways to see that uh, the American help is uh, well uh, employed. And uh, I think uh, you have had many uh, testimonies in the past by uh, American uh, authorities that it had been well employed. There are conditions uh, arranged in advance. And I don't think that um, there was ever any attempt in France to evade those conditions. Well, well, it's again, it, again <coughs> it's a question of uh, it's a question of arrangement through negotiations, you know. Mr. Ambassador, uh, France, like the United States, is fighting our common enemy on two fronts. You're trying to prepare in, in France and Europe, and you're also carrying on a war in China. Yes. And just as we are in Korea. Now, sir, how long has France been fighting in Indochina? Seven years now, seven long years. And how many uh, Frenchmen are engaged in the war in Indochina? We, in, fra in fact, France has to support in Indochina armies which amount to nearly 400,000 men. These are native troops <coughs> or Frenchmen or what are the proportions? Both. There are uh, troops from France, uh, troops from the French Union, from Africa, and uh, native uh, troops uh, from the um, from Vietnam, from the three uh, associated uh, states of Indochina. And is this a very expensive war to France? <coughs> it's, a very, it's a very expensive war, first in uh, human uh, lives. Unfortunately, uh, we have had uh, nearly 40,000 uh, people killed or missing in, Indo in Indochina. And how is that war going now, sir? It's, uh, it's uh, well, we, we, you saw uh, in the papers yesterday that the Viet Minh, the communists, uh, have started uh, an offensive now and uh, they have had a first uh, success, which I hope is not a very important uh, one. Now, that, that war is, like our own Korean war, is quite unpopular in France. Uh, it, is, it is an, an unpopular war because it's a very heavy burden uh, for France, both uh, in human lives, as I said, and uh, in uh, money. Here but it is realized that it's the way to stop communism in the Far East. Well, here in our own country, we are trying to find ways to end the war in Korea. Uh, does France have any, any hope of ending the war soon in, in Indochina? We are doing our, our best. Uh, we, are, uh, we are hoping that uh, the nationalists, the sincere nationalists in uh, Vietnam, in Indochina, will uh, desert the camp of uh, Ho Chi Minh, of the communists, and come to the camp of uh, Bao Dai, and we are organizing a Vietnamese army. Well, one well, last have you question. any evidence, Mr. Ambassador, that the uh, Russians are supplying them with equipment, or that the Chinese communists are supplying them with equipment? Uh, no doubt about it. The, the, the heavy equipment uh, they have, the recoilless uh, guns and uh, mortars, and uh, guns and shells, all that comes uh, from uh, other lands. Uh, they are unable to manufacture anything but uh, very light uh, weapons or uh, ammunition. Well, it sir, comes from China. Here in our uh, own country, we are talking a great deal about the possibilities of being able to train the South Koreans to, so that Asiatics yes. can oppose Asi Asiatics. What success has France had in training the native troops in Indochina? A real success. We have uh, now six uh, divisions of the Vietnamese army plus uh, smaller uh, Cambodian and uh, Laotian armies, fully trained, good soldiers, good uh, young officers, but it takes time, it takes time, of course. Well, one other thing I'm sure that uh, some of our viewers would like your view on. Uh, in America, there has been some feeling that in Indochina, we are being uh, handicapped a bit by some of the hangover French colonialism. Now, sir, are the French in Indochina fighting for the independence of the native peoples, or are you fighting to hold a colony? We are fighting for the independence, for preserving the independence of the native people. 
for uh, preventing them to fall under the Bolshevik uh, yoke. They have received their full independence. They are independent now. Unfortunately, they are not still able to protect themselves with that independence. Well, you contend then that France is fighting the same sort of war in Indochina that we are in Korea, that yes. we're both trying to free peoples from the communist Exactly. Mass. And it's uh, as costly a war in, any, in every respect. Well, Mr. Ambassador, I wish you could throw some light for us on this thing called neutralism in France. Yeah. What is neutralism? What do they feel? And how many people feel it? Uh, I'll answer uh, first about uh, how many people, very few people, very few people. It's the fact of uh, very limited circles in Paris. There is no party in the French Parliament, no group. And you know, we have various groups and several groups. There is no group uh, which is uh, called neutralist. No group which uh, pretends to be neutralist. In fact, I don't think there are any members of the French parliament who are neutralists. Well, there's a good deal of neutralist sentiment in the French press, isn't there, that finds expression in the French press? Not much, not much. Well, now, the neutralists feel, more or less, that here are two uh, giant imperialisms against each other, the Russians on the one side and the Americans on the other, and that uh, it would be better for France to let these two imperialisms fight each other and to sit it out while this fight goes on. Isn't that more or less the neutralist position? I don't know. I'm not very competent for defining the neutralist position, you know. And I think it's, uh, it varies with individuals, and it's uh, more vague uh, than you said. Uh, some of them probably uh, would like to uh, see France uh, <coughs> using uh, her <coughs> influence for preventing uh, a clash or uh, uh, diplomatic difficulties between um, the two camps, uh, including, inclu including even France, uh, fortunately, in the, in, the, in the camp of the free people. It's uh, something which is not very well defined, as I Mr. told you. Oh. Mr. Ambassador, of course, uh, France is a traditional great friend of America. It goes back to your helping us in our revolution. Thank you. And, of course, uh, a great many Americans have fought on French soil in the last yes. two world wars. Now, sir, what about uh, uh, anti-Americanism? Uh, we Are there any Frenchmen today who are hating America as the Russians want them to? Uh, I think uh, all that comes uh, from the Bolshevik uh, communist propaganda. There is no other source, you know. Well, is communism on the decline now in France, in your opinion? I think so. Well, what evidence is there, in your opinion? Well, uh, in evidence, for instance, uh, in the fact that the big uh, communist uh, newspaper, the Humanité, you know, had uh, two or three years ago 600,000 uh, circulation and now less than 200,000. The fact that uh, during the last elections, um, they lost, uh, they lost uh, half a million uh, votes. And it was at a time when the prices were very high, the wages were low. It was uh, really um, a favorable period for them. Nevertheless, they lost. So, and, they, uh, and since then, we are convinced that they have still lost uh, more votes than that. Have they been As able to make any trouble on the labor front? They are unable to make a real uh, political, any political trouble now. As a, as a final question, Mr. Ambassador, I'm sure that our viewers would like your opinion as to whether we can expect peace, whether you believe that we will have peace in the world during the next few years. I think uh, we are doing exactly what is needed for having peace. We are making sacrifices, all of us, which are heavy for the American taxpayer, heavy for the French taxpayer, but we are building a strength for the free world which will prevent war and to maintain peace, a peace which will become a lasting one, I hope. Well, um, thank you very much for being with us tonight, sir. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight are entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was His Excellency Henri Bonnet. Ambassador from France to the United States. Longines watches appeal to particular people.
to men and women of discrimination who look for faultless appearance and performance in a watch, as well as in the other things that they buy. For does solid worth appeal to you too? Then for excellence and elegance, Longines is the only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals. For accuracy, Longines watches have won countless honors from the world's great government observatories. In a Longines watch, discriminating men and women find faultless appearance and performance. So remember that if you spend $71.50 or more for a watch, you're paying the price of a Longines, and you should insist on getting a Longines, for throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that your mark as an American is X on the ballot. Vote for whom you please, but please vote. Enjoy Arthur Godfrey time, daytimes on the CBS television network. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this evening? Mr. William Bradford Huey, noted author and analyst and editor-in-chief of the Longines Chronoscope, and Colonel Elson Talbert, an editor of the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Miles J. Lane, United States Attorney. Mr. Lane, you, of course, are now one of the most famous crime fighters in the United States, since your office has handled the Hiss case, the Frank Costello case, the Remington case, the Rosenberg case. So I'm sure that our viewers would like you to tell us something about these cases tonight, sir. Now, first of all, the Rosenberg case, where this man and his wife were facing electrocution. Just what is the crime for which the Rosenbergs were convicted? <clears throat> well, they were convicted for conspiring to violate, violate the espionage laws of the United States in that uh, they had uh, conspired to, among other things, to turn over the secrets of the atom bomb to the Soviet Union. And both this man and his wife are now facing electrocution unless the president intercedes. Is that correct, sir? That's correct. Now, I'm wondering uh, if the Rosenbergs have given the government any help since their conviction or given any indication that they would like to help the government in uncovering other Soviet spies? To this moment, the Rosenbergs have not cooperated at all. They've given us no information, and they've been very adamant as far as cooperation is concerned. Well, Could they save their lives if they talked? Well, let me say this. I think that the... Uh, the American government is quite uh, reasonable, and uh, if they were to uh, cooperate to the fullest extent, I'm quite sure that that would be taken into consideration with respect to what uh, w might happen to them in the future. Well, now, with, with all of your experience with them and in the trial, sir, do you have any theories as to why they, they have refused to give the government any information at all? Well, I'm, I'm certain from what I've seen of them that they are dyed in wool communists and that they are, they are completely 
devoted to the Soviet Union. And to them, it's more or less of a cause, and they probably believe that they're modest to a cause or something to that effect. Now, do you think that it's, that it's terribly important that our government uh, uh, force them to talk or else execute them? Well, I, you put that question rather an odd way. Uh, I think it's very important to this government that we take a firm attitude, not only towards the Rosenbergs, but towards anybody that uh, conspires in any way to, to uh, overthrow this country or to commit acts of espionage against it. You think that perhaps it might have some effect on future cases if you, if these people do not talk on how much information you, you might get out of future cases? Well, I think it uh, will have a, a direct bearing upon future cases if uh, we don't uh, take a very firm attitude. Now, could you respect. illustrate for our viewers, sir, just how extensive was their knowledge about some of our secret activities? Uh, during the course of the trial, there was testimony that the Rosenbergs uh, had information uh, respecting uh, such things as our, our fire control system, uh, atomic energy for airplanes. They also had uh, some knowledge of this rocket that uh, was in contemplation at one time called the Sky Platform, which was a huge rocket which was to be sp sent into space and held there and uh, at, uh, through a system of electronics it could come down and destroy a city. They also had uh, uh, information uh, as it was developed at the trial respecting our, our fire control and uh, our underwater detection of submarines. Then it isn't true, sir, that they were very small fish. A great many Americans, I'm sure, are wondering uh, if they weren't inconsequential people. That, is, from your experience, that is not true. They were rel relatively high up in the apparatus. Well, I don't know just how high up they were, but <coughs> I think that uh, the Rosenbergs were very important in the apparatus, or one of the apparatuses. Well, now, you've, uh, you've just secured the conviction of uh, William Remington, I believe, for a crime somewhat similar to the crime of Alger Hiss. Isn't that correct, Mr. Lane? Uh, both Hiss and Remington were uh, convicted for perjury. And uh, one of the counts upon which Remington was convicted was for having given over secret or classified information to a representative of the Communist Party who was also a, a Soviet courier. Hiss was convicted for perjury in denying uh, that he had ever given over any uh, information or classified as secret information from the State Department to, uh, I believe it was Whitaker Chambers. So in both instances, although they were both Remington and Hiss were convicted for perjury, it was perjury for uh, lying, in effect, uh, when they were asked whether or not they had given over any classified information to others outside of the government departments. Well, there there's no doubt about the fact that both of these men were members of this apparatus which you've just described, is there? No, well, I wouldn't say that. Uh, they certainly knew uh, people who were communists, but whether or not they, they were actually members of the Communist Party, it's difficult to say. Uh, Remington, of course, was also uh, convicted for having lied when he said that uh, he had no knowledge of the Young Communist League at Dartmouth. And in the course of the trial, mm -hmm. we uh, developed that he had many contacts with communists and he attended Communist Party meetings and so forth. Well, incidentally, that young communist league at Dartmouth, sir, uh, interjected a rather human note in the trial. I believe you're an alumnus of Dartmouth, aren't you? Well, uh, <laughs> I happen to be the president of the general alumni at Dartmouth, and uh, naturally, with so many Dartmouth men being needled and uh, ribbed a little bit, uh, respecting the fact that there were communists at Dartmouth in the late 30s, I was most anxious that... Uh, Remington be convicted, not only because I felt he was guilty, but also because of the fact that I was a Dartmouth man, and as the prosecutor of Remington, I don't think it hurt the college too much to have a Dartmouth man put Remington away. Well, would you say that you had the full support of the Dartmouth alumni in this matter? I would say, without fear of contradiction, that I had the 100% support of every Dartmouth alumnus 
uh, in existence. Well, sir, I'm sure that our viewers uh, would expect to hear from you the latest report on the Costello case. What's Costello doing now? Well, Costello was convicted, as you know, for contempt of the Senate, and he is now in Milan prison. Uh, yesterday, we started an action against him in connection with a lien on his income taxes for roughly uh, $480,000. And we also have a denaturalization case against him in the office, which should come on for hearing or trial in the not too distant future. Well, in all of this uh, very interesting experience that you've had, sir, the one that's in the news most tonight is the waterfront situation in New York. Now, can you give our viewers uh, outside of New York some indication of how extensive graft is on the waterfront? Well, we have had, as you know, there are several, uh, there's a state crime commission working here on the waterfront and uh, doing an excellent job. And uh, I have had a grand jury working for the past 10 months. And that has done a magnificent job also. In the course of, uh, of their d deliberations and probings, we have found uh, extensive uh, uh, evidence, of, or rather evidence of extensive uh, corruption and, uh, and kickbacks this, and all that sort of thing. And does this corruption affect uh, every American family in some way, would you say? In view of the fact that uh, New York is the greatest port in the world and uh, the commerce of New York uh, way out, uh, out distances that of any other, I would say that the corruption and the kickbacks and all that sort of thing in New York City affects the life of every single American and I think it uh, is of particular interest to every housewife in America because the graft and the kickbacks will affect the price of every commodity that's being used by every family in the United States. Mr. Lane, you've uh, prosecuted successfully gangsters, uh, communists, and racketeers. I'm wondering what you think is the nation's greatest menace. Well, if I were to pick out any one thing as the greatest menace that this nation faces is, is the complacency of a lot of our, our citizens. I mean, uh, I think the American public uh, is, is sufficiently intelligent, probably the most intelligent public in the world, and I have all the confidence in the world in it. However, uh, I think that we've got to realize that it's time for us to accept the responsibilities as citizens, and by that I mean this, that we should have more people interested in doing jury duty, and also taking an interest in parent-teachers clubs, and taking a very intense interest in the future of the younger people of the country. Well, as, as a final question, Mr. Lane, a great deal has been written and said about the part that labor unions may have had to do with the waterfront uh, scandals. Now, are you going, do you expect to get the cooperation of, of the American Federation of Labor in the investigations? Oh, I think the American Federation has shown that it, it's with us 100%. I don't think that uh, labor itself is at fault a bit. I think labor, in labor, they have a few unscrupulous leaders, uh, but management also has a few in its ranks. Now, I have every confidence in labor, and I'm sure the American, lab uh, the American Federation labor will do everything it can to cleanse itself of the wrong elements. Well, thank you, sir, for being with us this evening. Thank you. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Colonel Elsel Talbert. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Miles J. Lane, United States Attorney. Longine is a superior watch in every respect. In fact, it's one of the finest watches made anywhere in the world. Yet Longine is in a class by itself. Thus, among the finest of the world's watches, Longine watches alone have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals at World's Fairs and international expositions. And in the competitive accuracy trials organized by great government observatories, the brilliant record of Longine over the years is a surpassing achievement. Yes, Longines is in a class by itself, for Longines is the world's most honored watch. So when next you buy a watch, either to indulge yourself or to give boundless pleasure to another, by all means, see and examine the Longines watches now at your authorized jeweler agency.
In style, they're the last word in good taste. In construction, they are faultless. In performance, they'll satisfy your every need. Among the finest watches of the world, there's but one Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Wetnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Wetnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This Sunday night, Ed Sullivan presents the Walt Disney Story on the CBS Television Network.